Thank you, and I want to begin by thanking my colleague, the Honorable Member for Kitchener Center, for such a thoughtful speech, and one which I, anticipates much of what I would say. Uh, we have not done enough in the year that we've had since C7 passed to know with any degree of certainty that we have lived up to our obligations when passing that act to fully study what it would mean to extend medical assistance in dying to those who are dealing with uh, deep suffering that comes from a mental health issue, but not from a medical diagnosis of traditional medicine such as ALS or cancer or the other cases that moved us forward on a, on a trajectory. I want to briefly canvas what brought us here in terms of the way in which the Parliament of Canada and the Supreme Court of Canada have dealt with medical assistance in dying. And I want to suggest, in closing, that when one looks to the Supreme Court of Canada for guidance, I do not believe we can say that the Supreme Court of Canada guidance takes us to the availability of MAID in cases of deep mental health distress. Going back, way back, as a member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands, I want to reflect on one of the champions, heroes, one might even say a martyr, on the issue of access to medical assistance in dying. I speak of Sue Rodriguez. She lived in North Saanich. So she lived in the electoral district that I'm honored to represent. She had ALS. She famously said, whose body is this? Who owns my life? She went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada back in 1993 in an effort to get access to the alleviation of suffering for a disease that would kill her. This was not in doubt. And the Supreme Court of Canada in 1993 denied her request. As others have mentioned in this place over the last couple of days of discussion, uh, a colleague and friend of many of us, uh, a dear friend of mine, Sven Robinson, uh, stayed with Sue Rodriguez when a doctor assisted her illegally and she took her own life because, well, the doctor assisted medical assistance in dying, probably the first public case in Canada. But the courts took a long time to change. That decision in 1993 wasn't changed until 2015 in the Carter case. And in the Carter case, the Supreme Court of Canada found, taking a slightly different aspect and taking a different view of it, that the charter rights in Section 7 to life, liberty, and security of the person were violated by not allowing a person to make such a decision and having access to medical assistance in dying. And the Carter case changed things by putting it squarely to the Parliament of Canada. You have to deal with this now. I want, want a quote from the Carter case, but the Supreme Court of Canada said that competent adults who seek such assistance as a result of grievous and irremediable medical conditions that cause enduring and intolerable suffering. That was the basis for, extent, for creating legal access to medical assistance in dying. And when C-14 went through, I tried so hard, I put forward amendments to say, we have to allow advanced directives. It's not right not to allow someone who knows that they're terminally ill and are facing incredible suffering. It's their choice. They should be able to, to access medical assistance in dying with an advanced directive. Back when C-14 went through, that was rejected. My amendments were rejected in the House, and similar amendments then were passed in the Senate, and we'll all recall it came back here. Uh, without accepting those amendments. C7 repaired that, but opened the door to something entirely different in terms of, and I do think it's entirely different, to say when people are suffering incredible, intolerable suffering due to a deep and chronic and unsolvable mental health condition, they should also have access to medical assistance in dying. And just go back and say what the political promises have been when we started down this road. When C-14 was being debated, and again, this is first I want to address the medical conditions. When C-14 was first debated, we had a lot of members in this place saying, what about palliative care? Would people choose medical assistance in dying if they had the option for palliative care? We heard many promises from the government benches that we would see increased funding for palliative care. That has not happened. 
So that's one thing that concerns me greatly. We've also had, since we passed C7, that there would be more supports for mental health. That hasn't happened either. So what would we do if we were serious about making sure that every Canadian could exercise fully their rights under Section 7 of the Charter to life, liberty, and security of the person? At least one would know that the health care system should be working well. I'm pleased to see the Premier's accepted the federal offer today. I hope the federal government will defend our public health care system with every ounce of their energy and make sure the deals with the provinces are specific and tied to outcomes and results. But our medical care, our health care system is in trouble. I was just talking to an incredible Indigenous woman. I won't say her name. It's a private conversation. She's Cree. She lost a dear friend recently because that Cree dear friend couldn't get access to medical care in time to diagnose and treat her cancer. And she leaves two small children behind. The health care system in this country isn't equal any more than the litany of deeply racist and distressing conditions in which the system works against justice for Indigenous peoples. We all know it in the context of the health care profession how, and the health care system, I should say. How can we not know it? We know it. In terms of mental health care supports, we know it even more deeply that the suicide rates among youth in this country are a huge source of concern. We know that mental health issues have been worsened among our youth through the pandemic, through isolation, through all kinds of things, through being preyed on by social media. We know that our schools, universities, and postgraduate programs are failing young people because they can't get the mental health supports they need when they need them. They need help to avoid addictions and to, and to kick addictions. They need, our young people need so much help, and we're failing them. Opening up MAID is not a solution to solvable mental health care issues where we're just falling down on the job because we're not providing the mental health supports that we've promised over the years. So what would we do if we wanted to be serious about Section 7 rights? We'd bring in a guaranteed livable income. Livable. A guaranteed livable income to ensure that no Canadian living in poverty, poverty being the number one social determinant of ill health in terms of physical health and mental health. We address poverty and end it through guaranteed livable income. We do more, as I mentioned, for the end of life issues, access to palliative care. There is such a thing as having a good death. We don't like talking about death in our society. We're all supposed to be young and preferably sexy forever. Let's face it. People get old and it's a lovely experience. It's a good thing to be healthy in old age and enjoy it right up to the moment that you um, either whatever you think is going to happen to you, meet your maker or feed the worms, whatever. A good death is a good thing. And medical assistance in dying does give people that option of a good death, surrounded by family, feeling loved. I'm very supportive of the work we've done in C14 and half of what we did in C7. But where are the mental health supports? Again, that at the point that the member for Timmins James Bay made, I totally agree. Yes, housing. Yes, supports. Yes, ending poverty. But I do think we have to explore and open up the, in the next year, let's get serious at looking at non-traditional therapies for people dealing with what appears to be irremediable depression. Do psychedelics make a difference? I'm not going to prescribe, as, as the honorable member for Tim and James Bay say, don't take health advice from, med, from politicians. But the evidence is coming in on using such products as psilocybin can actually trigger something that results not just in a bit less suffering and mental health conditions, but there are certainly papers out there that are peer-reviewed and very interesting that you can cure depression. I sure wouldn't want to turn my back on a potential cure and then embrace medical assistance in dying for people who could be cured. Neither do I want to turn my back on people who are suffering and saying, you're making us wait another year? Why are you doing that? These aren't easy issues. 
but these issues, life and death issues, are at the heart of the sacred, and they're the heart of our work in Parliament. Questions and comments? Question on Kamal Tara, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Just a brief comment before the question. And you know, we've had a number of speakers make reference to the issue of mental health, and I think that, uh, and this uh, member, the leader of the Green Party, also to, to palliative care. The greatest contribution that the Ottawa can do in regards to that area, mental health, health in general, palliative care, hospice care, uh, is by providing the financial resources and then using the Canada Health Act and raising the profile of uh, the issue itself. You can put a check mark on all three of those with respect to the last five, six years of this government. And um, at the end of the day, we do need to see more working together with provinces and uh, indigenous uh, communities to, in terms of continuously raising the profile of the issue to make sure that the resources are being properly allocated. Um, the question I have for the member is when you reflect on the legislation and the special joint committee that's out there, is there something specific that the leader of the Green Party would uh, filter out or, or like to see? General member for Senate, Gulf Islands. Thank you, my honorable colleague and parliamentary secretary. First of all, I, to his first set of comments, absolutely, I'm looking to the federal government to defend public single-payer universal health care is under the Canada Health Act. I'm looking at threats to that system that are, and I think for as much as people say, oh, we have to do it because things are bad right now. That's the work that has never stopped to undermine our public health care system in Canada by the forces for privatization. They must be resisted. I would throw one door open here. Before deciding that this is up to a group of experts, Please, let's get a reference to the Supreme Court of Canada to ask whether extending MAID to mental health conditions falls within the Supreme Court of Canada's understanding of the ruling in Carter. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, I really want to thank my colleague for not just her speech, but she talked about some opportunities as well. And she also cited false, uh, broken promises when it came to palliative care. You know, I, I, as you know, Mr. Speaker, I was here last Monday and the Monday before, would have been here tonight on adjournment proceedings to drag the government here to talk about mental health. But it was disrupted, so I'm back. And Mr. Speaker, I asked the Minister about mental health just last week. And she cited through the proposed bilateral agreements on the shared health priorities where we are working with the provinces and territories to integrate mental health and substance use as full and equal part of our universal health care system. However, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the reality on the ground, they haven't delivered on their promised mental health transfer, a $4.5 billion still. Even the agreements that they signed with the provinces today don't assure that. There, what we need, Mr. Speaker, and I'm going to ask through you to my colleague, does she agree, that we need enshrined in legislation parity with mental and physical health to have a proper conversation in this House about expanding medically assisted and dying with those that are, you know, uh, that are their, their sole underlying medical condition identified is a mental illness. Thank you. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. No, I think, I think we, one of my favourite rec uh, recommendations from medical doctors around mental health, and because the Honourable Member from Courtney Alberni is from such a beautiful place in the world, I don't know if he knows that uh, Dr. Melissa Lamb prescribes visiting national parks, pres prescription scripts to get out into nature. But to answer his question simply, I agree, yes, parity. We do have a few moments for another question, if somebody's interested. Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the, government, to, to the Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank uh, my friend from Senate Gulf Islands uh, and her uh, uh, relationship with uh, Sud Rodriguez and, and, and the, the, the first battle towards medical assistance in dying that took place uh, decades ago, which in fact has brought us here. Um, the expert panel 
uh, that was convened, um, uh, reported uh, in the summer, and, and they outlined a number of different areas in which the systems are ready. Uh, of course, um, as, as, uh, as a government, we've heard from a number of different parties about the need for an extension. I'm wondering if my friend could advise what specific issues she has with the expert panel report uh, and, and uh, with, with respect to medical assistance in dying uh, in respect of uh, mental health as the sole and underlying condition. We are almost out of time, but I will allow the member to, to answer. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Again, very briefly, Mr. Speaker, yes, there's an expert panel looking at the medical and mental health conditions, but I think we've skipped a step in making sure what we're doing remains constitutional.